Way, way back in time, an influential French guy once said, Patience is bitter, but its fruit is sweet. Sometimes the answers you're looking for are just around the corner and often in the last place you look. You just need to have the patience and persistence to see things through. Even if you come up short in the end, that effort and drive won't go unnoticed. If you don't quite get it right the first or second time around, maybe your efforts will be just enough to open the doors for somebody else. Like with Lost Media Hunts, if you've got any energy left in you to keep on searching, just do it. Exhaust every possible resource and leave no stone unturned, even if you have to take a few breaks along the way. During my investigations, there were so many times where I mistook patience for stagnancy, and I assumed that physical action was the only measure of progression. But sometimes, things can come around when you stop intervening and just let nature take its course. I mean, they do say slow and steady wins the race. I had to enact so much patience when exploring the mysteries behind Saban Moon in part one of this series. So many months were spent trying to find new answers. Had I given up my search, I never would have had the chance to speak with Lynn Walsh, and if not for that interview, I never would have been able to uncover new information about Project Y. And without that very crucial sit-down, I never would have made contact with the mysterious man in red and Rocky Solotov, two men who could potentially hold more secrets about the lost live-action pilot. If I hadn't kept digging down this rabbit hole, the story of Saban Moon would still be a handful of leaked cells and a haunting piece of footage from the Anime Expo recorded so many years ago. And somehow, even with all of that progress made, little did I know I had barely scratched the surface of my investigation. And in between my time waiting for this climactic sit-down with the two men at the center of this mystery, new unexpected leads had revealed themselves, and I very quickly found myself, once again, attempting to rearrange the missing pieces of an over 20-year puzzle. In this episode of Tales of the Lost, we pick up right where we left off from part one of the western world of Sailor Moon. I finally have the opportunity to sit down with the CEO of Two makers himself, Rocky Solotov, and the producer of live action, known as the Mysterious Man in Red. In anticipation for this interview, I decided to take a look at the new leads and people of interest that popped up as a result of the previous doc that could possibly bring me closer to the answers I seek, and in the end, find myself tying up a lot of loose ends I never thought were possible. Was I successful at uncovering anything new about Saban Moon from my sit-down with Rocky and the Man in Red? Or perhaps my answers came from the new leads that showed up along the way. This is the thrilling conclusion of the Western world of Sailor Moon. If not for my discussion with Lynn, there's no doubt that I wouldn't be standing here today, on the receiving end of communication with Saban Moon's producer of live action and good friend to Toonmaker CEO, Rocky Solotov. 
He suggested that the three of us sit down for a call to discuss their time and memories working on Project Y. I had so many questions and was so excited to have reached this point in my search. What more could be revealed about this lost pilot? Would they be able to confirm any of my previous theories? Or maybe they could reveal the identities of the remaining cast of the live-action pilot. Perhaps Rocky and the man in red had their own little keepsakes from Saban Moon that they'd be willing to share, maybe even a copy of the missing pilot. I was dying to know. And if you're totally confused as to how I got to this point, who Rocky Solotov even is, or what the heck is a Project Y, I'd strongly urge you watch the previous episode, The Western World of Sailor Moon Part 1, as this serves to a follow-up to that piece. Go ahead, if you have an hour and 30 to kill, pause this and meet me back here when you're finished, okay? I want you to be just as invested in this whole thing as I am, alright? Okay? Cool. Now that you're up to speed, after a bit of back and forth between Rocky, myself, and the men in red, we finally landed on a date where we could all sit down and talk. It would be a whole month and a bit before I could finally pick their brains. At first, I dreaded the idea of having to wait any longer, but I think in hindsight, what initially felt like a long haul to the project ended up becoming an opportunity for me to slow down and look at this investigation with a more careful eye, which, in the end, had turned out to yield more results than I'd anticipated. So before we can get to this big reveal, the big sit-down interview I teased in part one, I think it's imperative that I cover the events that transpired in between leading up to my interview with Rocky and the Man in Red, because in the end, these events that transpired during my wait turned out to be those same key elements that helped me wrap up all the missing pieces to this almost year-long investigation. I received so much feedback from viewers across the globe immediately after the premiere of The Western World of Sailor Moon. It was really great to hear people's stories perusing the web in the 90s and reading about their heartfelt memories growing up with the series. I even appreciated the corrections and feedback that was given in regards to my own research. I'm pretty much a one-man show, so I knew I wouldn't be able to get everything down correctly, so thanks for that. <laughs> Interestingly enough, of all the emails and messages to have come through, I also received handful of new tip-offs and information on possible new leads to investigate that hadn't previously been covered in the first part of the series. Fans had tipped me off to a few new names in particular that I wasn't able to fully investigate before, and with a whole month and a bit before my official sit-down with Rocky and the Man in Red, I figured why not look further into this whole thing while I still have the chance? Perhaps some new information could come out of this that could be brought up during my final interview. Certainly one of these new leads could yield some new information, so I began to look more thoroughly at all the new information that had come in. I was led in so many directions, with some people even suggesting that the pilot itself was held in archives like the Library of Congress of all places. A little harder to investigate, but definitely worth looking into. But more specifically, I had been given the names of three new individuals who were rumored to have been part of Project Y, with more direct contact and a higher chance at responding to my inquiries. This is where I thought I would have the best chance at getting more information. The first person I'd been made aware of was legendary musician Ron Wasserman, best known for composing the iconic Power Rangers theme song. It was rumored that he had quite possibly had a hand at the musical arrangement heard in the Saban Moon music video. Ron was no stranger to the world of Sailor Moon, as he had also been credited as a writer and composer for a few songs off of the Deke soundtrack for the English dub. Ron's previous ties to Saban, Toy A, and Renaissance Atlantic in the early 90s only strengthened the probability of him having some connections to the pilot. This is especially more plausible when you consider the fact that the idea of a live-action iteration had only come to fruition from the climbing success of Renaissance's most successful live-action show, The Power Rangers. Luckily, Ron wasn't very hard to track down, as he often communicated with fans over on Instagram and Facebook, and seemed to be very open to responding to fan inquiries. With a higher likelihood of hearing back from him, it just made sense to reach out and see if he'd be willing to answer some of my own questions. So I sent an email and linked the old clip from the Anime Expo to see if he had any insight or if he could confirm his involvement with the musical score. And soon enough, I managed to get a response. 
Hi, Raven. From what I remember, that was a long time ago. I only remember writing a few songs for the Sailor Moon album. Not sure it had anything to do with the pilot because I was deeply entrenched at Saban in 94, doing Power Rangers, X-Men, Sweet Valley High, etc. until I left there in late 95. Let me know what you think. Ron. Upon listening to the Anime Expo clip, Wasserman had this to add. Hi Raven. It's odd. That does sound vaguely familiar, but I'm not 100% sure if I was involved with writing it or perhaps just mixing it. Just don't know. I've written thousands of things since then, and a lot of it becomes a blur. Ha! <laughs> Wish I could be of more help. Feel free to ask me anything else. Ron. Unfortunately, with all of the projects he'd worked on in the early 90s, it was hard for Ron to fully confirm whether or not he had any involvement in creating the music for the Toon Maker's live action pitch. He did mention, however, that the tune sounded vaguely familiar, so unless I was able to find a higher quality version of the clip, or perhaps uncover more lost media pertaining to Saban Moon, it might be hard to get a solid answer. Still, I appreciated Ron's willingness to help and took note of his offer to answer any more questions questions if needed be. If I happen to find anything else, at least that line of communication was now open. But for now, I had to move on. So I tucked this away in my back pocket and proceeded to look into two more leads that had shown up on my radar. Soon after my communication with Ron, I was then contacted by Twitter user Corza Moon and Adam of Sailor Moon News, who both suggested I reach out to rumored Saban Moon actress Tammy Adrian George. This rumor was so much stronger than the last. I believe it caught wind during the old Anime Fringe interview with Rocky Solotov, where he had briefly mentioned working with the Starship Troopers actress. She was supposedly cast to play Sailor Jupiter. This piece of information stayed largely unconfirmed because it's kind of hard to tell whether or not it's actually Tammy Adrian George in the footage that we've got. But it had recently been revealed to Corza, having reached out to the actress, that Tammy had, in fact, been a part of Project Y. She was our Sailor Jupiter. And after being told of my hunt for connections to the pilot, she was open to the idea of sitting down to speak with me. This was great news. Another name to come out of the woodwork who was kind enough to answer more questions. I wondered what kind of stories Tammy would be able to share of her time on set. So many years had gone by. Would she remember any key details? Or even the names of her fellow cast members? Or perhaps some things would find their way back to her memory once the questions began to flow in. I was very eager to hear her side of the story. But that wasn't all Corza had come to find in his search. While all of this was transpiring, a third person of interest had suddenly popped into the mix. While investigating on LinkedIn, Corza had come into contact with another individual who had past ties to Renaissance Atlantic, a name I had previously come across in my search but was sadly unable to get a hold of, a woman known as Ellen Price. Under her bio, Ellen Price was known as the development and production executive for Renaissance Atlantic from 1994 to 1997. She was even responsible for producing all of the One Sheet's artistic bibles and video pilots. And what really caught my eye was her listing of Sailor Moon as one show Renaissance Atlantic had worked on for the Japanese toy company Bondi. Would Ellen be able to provide any more information on this? Having been responsible for all the art bibles and video pilots, Surely there must have been some chance she had recollections of developing this pilot, or even memories of the art bible contents. Perhaps even, she was still in possession of some of the material she worked on all those years ago. I asked Corza if he would once again work his magic, and within a couple of days, I had myself a new phone number. Ellen had asked that I give her a call that evening, but that very same day, there was no response communication there had turned a little bit shaky, and I'm not quite sure if it was because I had been calling from a different country, or maybe because my name looked suspicious on the caller ID, as I wasn't even able to leave a message. I attempted to call a few more times, but didn't want to overwhelm her with phone calls. And then the trail went cold. I wanted answers, but I didn't want to look like some weirdo. So unfortunately, this would be another venture I'd have to revisit for another time. Perhaps I could call again at a later date, and maybe from there, things would just kind of fall into place. But for now, just like with Ron, my conversation with Ellen would be another chapter I'd need to add to my back pocket. Thank you. 
Even though I wasn't able to speak with Ellen, I was hopeful that I'd hear back from her down the line. And my investigation was far from over, because luckily, I still had something to look forward to. My correspondence with Tammy Adrian George. Eager to learn more about the cancelled project, I followed up with her over on Instagram, giving her more context on the documentary I was working on and wondering if she'd still be interested in partaking. And right around the time my attempts to contact Ellen had failed, Tammy's messages finally came through. And from there, our interview continued over email. Do you remember what the interview process was like? Were there a lot of people in the casting call? I do remember it being a busy casting. Not just this audition, but that time period as well. Pilot season is always a whirlwind of auditions, sometimes five a day. At least two or three of us were running into each other at other auditions. I think Mindy, her character was in the wheelchair, was the only one who was under 18 IRL. Was the Sailor Moon live action pilot your first experience in acting? What started your passion for acting? No, Sailor Moon was not my first gig. I'd been modeling and acting while finishing college. I graduated in 1992, and because I looked much younger and I'm short, I usually got the teen slash college parts. I did print work slash commercials for Miller's Outpost, JCPenney, Tampax, Big Red, Secret, plus a jillion others, and a lot of music videos for young artists like Tevin Campbell. My modeling agent said you need to be acting. I was never going to do high fashion. In fact, my first acting gig was for an educational series called Math Keys. Ha! Every now and then I'll meet someone who says, You taught me math! I've always been a performer of some kind. Competitive dance and cheer, local and school shows. I just didn't train for it until I was an adult. My degree is in writing applied to advertising and public relations. My family's from the Caribbean and it's no big deal to have multiple degrees, certifications, and careers. Do you have any onset memories with the cast and crew? Wow. As goofy as it looked, we had a blast doing that song. I think her name is Danny, Asian actress, and I both had dance backgrounds. We both had naturally long hair that was tucked under those god-awful wigs. Getting fitted for our school uniforms was hilarious because we couldn't be too sexy. The voiceover work was amazing because I got to work with Patricia Alice Albright, an amazing, prolific voice actor who was definitely a part of my childhood. I vaguely remember Adrienne Barbeau, but only that she was kind to us and still gorgeous. Do you remember the names of any of the girls you had worked with on set, including any additional cast members or crew members? Danny, Mindy, Stephanie Dickerson, or Dickinson maybe? She and I both worked on the Soap General Hospital, I think, but at different times. Danny and I would run into each other sometimes, but castings were usually done by racial groups, so you just never knew who you'd see. With the type of show Sailor Moon is, I'm guessing there were a lot of different costumes on set. Did they have the girls dress up in superhero outfits, or were those action shots strictly for the animated portion? Darn. No superhero costumes. School uniform? Casual wear? PJs? Anything with powers was the animated part. Do you remember how you found out about the pilot project? It was just another audition. The filming was maybe a week or so, and because my agents knew it was a pilot presentation, that meant they were looking for more funding. Our hopes were to get a full pilot done, but in the meantime, there were other jobs to work on getting. Had you ever watched Sailor Moon, or did you know about the Japanese series prior to auditioning for the role of Sailor Jupiter? No. Do you still keep in touch with any of the cast? No, we lost touch. Do you happen to remember Sailor Jupiter's civilian name that she used on Earth when she wasn't in her superhero form? I don't. Someone told me it was Lita, but I don't recall that. Do you have any memories of shooting this music video? I remember one of the producers and the director coming into the makeup room playing the song and asking if we could dance to it. Danny and I hopped to it right away. Funny, I remember dancing in that makeup room more than I remember dancing on set. We learned the words and sang the song too. The version you hear now sounds more like a mashup to me. Did you ever think the project would have gained such a large online cult following in recent years? Now that I've been part of a few cult loves, Starship Troopers, Star Trek DS9, Beverly Hills 90210, so many black sitcoms, General Hospital, Bratz, Big Time Rush, and my husband Eric Bruscotter has had the same long-term love from his fans, I'm not surprised anymore. I think there's something so wonderfully dorky about projects from decades past. The Star Trek episode I guest starred on was directed 
directed by Anson Williams, and James Darren was on the episode as well. Two seriously talented performers with great bodies of work and deep fan bases from decades before. And I was starstruck. I spent every free moment singing old songs with them. Do you happen to have any relics from your time on set that you'd be willing to share with us for this documentary, whether it be photographs, set pieces, wardrobes? I didn't keep anything. We'd always thought that the pilot would get funded, so production held on to everything from my character. Even the wig! Are there any upcoming projects that you're working on or any business you'd like to advertise? Most of the time that I was acting, 20 plus years, I also had a side business as a Pilates instructor. 31 years now. It was something to keep me grounded and to give me the freedom to turn down parts that I didn't want to do. Major nudity, girlfriend of drug dealer gangbanger, super destitute crackhead, wasn't for me. Other actors took those parts and turned them into something brilliant. It was meant to be. It let me know that this was no longer fulfilling me because I wasn't willing to go there. And the travel was getting tough once I had my son and my husband's health was taking a downturn. I was getting offered gigs in other countries or on the other side of the US. I didn't want to miss my son growing up. I stopped acting around 2015 maybe? Though every now and then, I might still do a modeling gig. Social Paint was a recent one. I own Tammy's take on Pilates, rehab, nutrition, specializing in sports specific training and in rehab work. My nutrition work is usually with someone who's dealing with a medical diagnosis, not just wanting to lose a few before a wedding. I've also recently become an instructor on OPC, OnlinePilatesClasses.com, a membership platform that caters to other instructors and some diehard Pilates lovers all over the world. That's what was launching for me last week, and the response has been amazing. A streaming platform just offered me my own show, so you never know how things circle back. I've been so lucky to realize that I was getting more joy from helping people overcome their obstacles than I ever did from a performance. Even hair and makeup could be drama because sometimes they didn't have product or personnel who knew how to work with brown people. Maybe if the times had been more like they are now, diverse casting without having to beg to be seen for a white part, actually pay, better accommodations for parents, etc. I loved acting, but not like I love healing people. Put it this way. The connection to my clients is so powerful. I've had some of them for 20 years. The great thing about being an actor people recognize is that I'm always connecting with someone new. Sometimes it's how a new client finds me and it's a great icebreaker. Sometimes it's just a great conversation at the beach. Sometimes it's getting to wander down memory lane with people like you. Best to you. Keep me posted on what you find. Tammy. It was great getting the chance to pick the brain of someone who could have been the face and voice of Sailor Jupiter had things gone differently. It felt surreal hearing about Tammy's time on set, filming with the rest of the cast, and I never expected all of the new leads that would have come in from our interaction. She'd managed to name four of her co-stars she'd worked with while filming the live-action pilot. According to Tammy, Sailor Mercury was played by a girl called Mindy. Sailor Mars's actress was known as a woman named Danny and an actress by the name of either Stephanie Dickerson or Stephanie Dickinson supposedly played the role of Sailor Moon. Unfortunately, Tammy was unable to recall the name of her co-star who played Sailor Venus. Even still, I was left with two nicknames and a full name with alternate spelling, all new persons of interest to look into. Tammy revealed that they had not only worked alongside legendary actress Adrienne Barbeau, who voiced Queen Serenity and Queen Beryl, but they had also done voice work with the American actress Patricia Alice Albrecht, who famously voiced Phyllis in the 80s animated series Gem and the Hologram. Patricia Albrecht was intended to voice Luna in the live-action adaptation. Sadly, any hopes of reaching out to Patricia had come a little too late, as the actress had long since passed away at the age of 66 in December of 2019. My investigation now boiled down to Mindy, Danny, and of course, Stephanie. Mindy and Danny would prove to be a lot more challenging to find, as I only had their first names to really go off of, and these names Tammy could recall were more likely their nicknames. A more thorough investigation would have to be done to find the actresses who played Sailor Mars and Sailor Mercury, and maybe, just maybe, my search for these girls' identities would eventually lead me to the final scout, Sailor Venus. But first, it was time to find Stephanie.
Unlike Danny and Mindy, looking for Stephanie, a full-named active actress in the early 90s who previously worked with Tammy Adrian on other projects, felt like a cakewalk. During our interview, Tammy mentioned that she and Stephanie had both worked on the ongoing 1963 series, General Hospital, so my search quickly led me to IMDb to check out a list of the show's full cast and crew. My hope was that Stephanie would have been listed under these credits, despite not having a reoccurring part on the series. I kept my eyes out for anyone with the name Stephanie, and anyone with a last name close to Dickerson or a Dickinson. Stephanie Braxton, nope. Stephanie Williams, no. Stephanie C. Allen, but at the very bottom of the page, the very last Stephanie listed was a woman who played a character known as Gina Williams. This actress was listed as Stephanie Dicker. Though she didn't have a photo on IMDb, all it took was a quick Google search to see that she was more than likely the girl I had been looking for. Overlaying images of Stephanie and the girl in the music video, it was plain to see that this was definitely her. Stephanie Dicker was our live-action Sailor Moon. In her acting career, Stephanie was most active from 1981 to 2001 and made appearances on shows like General Hospital, Boy Meets World, Saved by the Bell, and even Friends. She even appeared to be a series regular on the 1997 show Fame LA. Since then, Stephanie hasn't been in the acting world for some time. She got married in 1996 and currently goes under the last name Shanfield. Today, Stephanie Shanfield still lives in Los Angeles and works as a realtor under her own agency. Agency. With a few weeks left until my sit down with Rocky and the Man in Red, I wondered if there was any time left to reach out and schedule a possible interview with Stephanie. I'm sure like Tammy, she may have still had some memories of being on set from all those years ago. Maybe she had more information on Mindy and Danny or would even be able to disclose the identity of Sailor Venus. I wondered if she was aware of the small cult following that had grown from Saban Moon, and all of the people who had attempted to hunt down copies of not only the music video, but the pilot itself. Perhaps with her playing the lead role of Sailor Moon, this would be a project she'd be happy to share her stories with. Or maybe not. Maybe she wouldn't even remember. But it was still worth reaching out before concluding my documentary. I kept telling myself, leave no stone unturned. Because if Rocky and the Man in Red say they didn't have the tapes, maybe others connected to the project would. With it being so far into the past, there was a good chance she'd have no idea what I was talking about. But I sent her an email I found off of her website, tried not to come off as too creepy, and hoped for the best. Things went pretty silent for the next couple of weeks, and at that point, I figured I probably wouldn't be hearing back from her. Odds were, she either didn't want to talk about it, wasn't interested, or she just didn't remember. Still, if Stephanie ever wanted to sit down for an interview, I would love to sit down and hear from Sailor Moon herself about her experiences. In the meantime, it was still Danny and Mindy. And although I didn't have a lot to go off of name-wise, I had hoped that taking a second look at my interview with Tammy could potentially help with extracting more clues about the identities of the remaining Sailor Scouts. Finding Danny and Mindy proved to be much more challenging, as all I really had to go off of were their first names. So I figured my best move was to go right back to my conversation with Tammy Adrian George. Some key details she provided could help to better pin down these actresses. From my interview with Tammy, I could conclude the following details about Danny and Mindy. The girls would often see one another in passing at casting calls, and though they were in their early 20s, in 1994, they were often cast for younger teen roles due to their youthful appearances. For Danny, I was looking for an Asian actress, now in her early 50s or mid 40s. In 1994, Danny would have had long hair, as Tammy had mentioned that both she and Danny were fitted into uncomfortable short wigs that had to hide all of their long hair. And like Tammy, Danny was also a trained dancer. 
The only thing I was really able to gather about Mindy was that in real life, the actress didn't actually have paraplegia. Another detail I had to keep in mind was that, according to Tammy, out of all the cast members, Mindy was the only actress who was actually under 18 when they had started shooting the pilot, which would mean I'd need to look for a red-haired Caucasian actress in her late 30s or early 40s. Knowing that Tammy Adrian was often cast in teen dramas and sitcoms made narrowing down the possible shows they would have likely appeared on a little bit easier. Tammy mentioned in our sit-down that she would be running to up to five auditions daily and would often run into two or three of the other girls auditioning for the same shows. And these shows would have likely been teen sitcoms and dramas of the late 80s and early 90s. So I wound up scrolling through the IMDb cast and crew lists of shows like Blossom, Boy Meets World, My So-Called Life, and any other 90s teen drama Tammy had made an appearance on. If their paths had crossed as much as Tammy recalled, surely some of the girls would have booked other auditions for the same shows. There may be some kind of overlap here, other than the time Tammy had worked with Stephanie on General Hospital and also Boy Meets World. I searched high and low for any cast and crew members who had the same names as Mindy and Danny. I even attempted to search under different spellings of their presumed full names, Danielle and Melinda. But... As persistent as I was to make some sort of find, my search had unfortunately led me nowhere. Being able to get a clear picture of the girls would have made this so much easier, I thought to myself. If only I could get my hands on higher quality footage. If only there was a way to master that captured footage at the Animate Expo. Maybe then it would be a much simpler task of identifying these girls. And on top of this limitation, I didn't even have a first name for the actress behind Sailor B. Venus, the remaining Sailor Scout. <sighs> so once again, it was just something I had to put away for later into my back pocket. Just when I thought my trail had gone cold, I wound up receiving a very curious email from a man by the name of Ian Landry, who claimed to be in direct contact with a possible lead I had briefly looked into in my last documentary. Ian had on and off communication with Raymond Iacovacci, a name I had seen many times in my search, the producer of animation who appeared in the cast photo that Lynn Walsh shared with me, the same Raymond Iacovacci whose storage locker was cleared out all those years ago, which was a key event that sparked the rumors of the existence of an Americanized Sailor Moon. Yep, that same Raymond Iacovacci that's said to own a copy of the Saban Moon pilot that's rumored to be tucked away in his storage locker in the Philippines. Ian had come to know Raymond through his own investigation into Saban Moon. As an artist and animator, Landry was looking to start a Saban Moon project and recreate the pilot from the ground up using both existing animation stills and portions from the scripts that had been leaked online. He reached out to Raymond to research further into the project, and through their shared love of animation, the two remained in contact. Well, sort of. During one of Ian's sit-downs with Raymond, he confirmed that he was, in fact, in possession of the lost tape, and that it was tucked away in one of his storage lockers. Ian made many attempts at convincing Raymond to share the recording, but Raymond would always decline, as he would need permission from those who owned the original copyright before publicly releasing it. He did, however, make mention that if he were to show the tape in full, it would have to be through a private screening. But with Raymond no longer living in the Philippines, would it even be possible for him to retrieve a copy of the tape? Then suddenly, out of the blue, their contacts got a little bit weird. Raymond was described as being more or less flaky and a bit of a shady character. He would randomly pop up, then disappear for months on end, moving from place to place only to respond months later, continuing their conversation as if no time had passed in between. To make things a little more complicated, whenever Project Y was brought up, Raymond would switch back and forth from being an open book to suddenly becoming tight-lipped. And much of his stories were said to, at times, conflict with previous retellings of his time at Toonmakers. Because of this, Ian began to question the legitimacy of Raymond's claims, as his stories would often devolve into what felt like tall tales. Perhaps Raymond's memory wasn't what it had been before, or perhaps something was being kept hidden. After watching part one of my documentary and seeing Raymond's name pop up, Ian wanted to reach out to give me further insight on his own experiences with the animator and potentially 
potentially act as a point of contact. Despite Raymond's claims of being in possession of Saban Moon, Ian held the hope that my meeting with Raymond could potentially yield a different outcome and could possibly be the sit down to reveal the truth of all Raymond's confusion. Another person connected to Project Y claiming to be in possession of the tape, but also a character I was told to keep my wits about. There was no way I wasn't going to look into this further and potentially set up a meeting of some sort. Maybe the rumors circulating about him were true. What if Raymond was the only person left with a legitimate copy of the pilot? Maybe he would know what came of the original cast members and just maybe he was in possession of more lost keepsakes from Project Y. Perhaps his perspective would be drastically different from my upcoming sit-down with Rocky Solotov. I thanked Ian for passing along Raymond's contact information and let him know I'd be in touch, but I was told to proceed with an absolute air of caution, as this apparently would not be an easy interview. After my talk with Ian, I was told to try my luck at calling Raymond myself to see if he'd be interested in discussing his time working on Project Y. In the first half of this documentary, I'd made a few attempts at reaching out to Raymond, but the email and phone number I got my hands on most likely weren't in service anymore. But this new number given to me by Ian was undoubtedly his most recent contact info. I also had to keep in mind that Raymond had been described by Ian and many others as excessive eccentric and a bit of a boastful character. I've never met him, so I wasn't really in any place to cast any judgments. But with him claiming to be in possession of the pilot, I didn't want to do or say anything that would threaten my communication with him, as I didn't really know what to expect. Could the tape really be hidden at his storage locker in the Philippines? From what I was told about him, would Raymond be willing to cooperate with me, or would he just up and disappear? What's the worst that could happen here? With how aloof people said he was, he probably wouldn't even pick up, I thought. And if he doesn't pick up, then I can just move on. Hello? Uh, hi. Is this Raymond Diacovacci? Yes, who's calling? Hi, my name's Raymond Simone and Your I'm name's Raven from... Simone? <laughs> well, were you named after the girl from the Cosby show? Yes. Oh, <laughs> My condolences. Oh. <laughs> so why are you calling, Raven? Oh, I I'm a filmmaker working on part two of a documentary about the unaired pilot of the Tune Maker's live-action Sailor Moon pitch. Would you be free at all to sit down and have a chat about it? Oh, say hi to my wife. Huh? My wife. She's here. She says hello. Uh, hi? <laughs> okay, all right. Anyways, uh, what do you need? You want an interview? Yes. It's been over 20 years. What more is there to say about it? Oh, you'd be surprised that the cult following this project still has. There are so many people who are curious about the production of the series and its inception, and they'd be more than happy to hear from you about this. Mm, you know what? I'll do it. I'll tell you what. Let's set up a time and talk about it. That sound good? Yeah, sure. That would be great. 6 p.m. tomorrow. That sound good? Yeah, that's fine. Um, I, I should be able to have all my questions ready. Okay, Raven. I'll see you then. Bye-bye now. Uh, bye. So, um, would you like to tell me a bit about your background as an animator before working with Tune Makers? Um, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it quickly. So, uh, I graduated high school in June of 1980. Ten minutes later, I drive to Hollywood and I get a job at a bank. I was 18 years old. Uh, of course, I worked for a union bank in Beverly Hills because I was good at math, and I succeeded at it. And I'm not saying this to blow my own horn, because I'm very humble. I'm just telling you the truth. So uh, they put me in charge of the entertainment investment banking department and my clients were the cast of MASH, the cast of Happy Days, uh, Ronnie Howard, Bob Hope, Groucho Marx, uh, John Belushi, Dan Agra, Jane Fonda, Dan Aykroyd. What? Yeah, at 18 years old, they were coming to me for investment advice. And then one day I was working for Charles Keating, who was the mastermind behind the Lincoln Savings and Loan debacle in the summer of 86. They were actually bribing me to 
lie to the customers saying that the investments were insured. Now, who are my customers there? On the Hollywood Boulevard branch, Michael Cimino, the director of The Deer Hunter, Robert De Niro, Dustin Hoffman. Uh, yeah, so after they started bribing me, Senator Alan Cranston, who was the Senator of California that year, he called me and I said, Senator Cranston, I've had enough of this. You're bribing me to lie to good people. So the story I always say, and this is the God's honest truth, I walk home and my wife at the time, she said, what's up? I said, I've had enough. She says, then just don't go back. So we sat down and watched Oprah Winfrey. A couple of weeks later, I got a job as a delivery boy at Deke. A delivery boy. Three years later, I was production manager on The Simpsons. That's awesome. So what happened was I started at Deke Animation, and you know what was ironic is that all those years as a banker, I never made more than five or six hundred dollars a week. But as a delivery boy, I was making eight hundred bucks a week, okay? And I, and I've been an artist my whole life, you know, I can draw, I went to art school. Twice. I was on The Simpsons for three seasons making 800 bucks a week and I went to my boss who was a good guy and I says, Mike, I'm producing the number one show in the world and you guys can't pay me more than six, seven hundred bucks a week. And he says, I'll do what I can. So what happened was I got a phone call from Jeff uh, Swampy Marsh and Dan Povenmeyer, who created Phineas and Verb. We worked together on The Simpsons, and that's where we met. And what happened was Swampy came to me, and I said, and I quote, Can you produce an animated feature film, a two-hour animated film in Russia for two million dollars? And I said, yes, I can. He said, you're hired. I said, if I can get us a project, will you and I and Dan be partners and we'll do the project in Russia? he said, absolutely. So a week later, I got us a project for Vice President Al Gore. It was a 15-minute anti-drug and alcohol film for kids, or that, uh, a dare. You know, you know, like a dare to keep kids off drugs, uh, D-A-R-E, uh, and I don't know. Anyway, I said, hey, Swampy, I got us the project. How much do you love me now? The more the money, the more the projects kept coming in. And then one day I said, you know what, F it. You know, you know, 18 years in New York, 18 years in Hollywood, 18 years in Asia, I need a break. And I came to the state and got a job working for the Christian Broadcast Company. And then, uh, what did I do with the Christian thing? Uh, there was a TV show with Patrick Duffy and Suzanne Somers and a young actress named Angela Watson. She calls me out of the blue and says, I want you to write and direct and produce something for me and a man named Gil Cabot. Uh... After taking it, I took a year off because my brother died. Oh! Suddenly, I had a two-year-old daughter who died, and then I had a fiancé, seven months pregnant, with my baby killed in a car crash. Oh my god, I I'm sorry to hear about that. Um... Should I keep that in or...? Uh, even with all that, all those turmoils, I went from delivery boy to head of a studio within, what, five, six years? Uh, so, finally, after taking a year off, I went back to Hollywood on Valentine's Day of uh, 2009. Took me a whole month to get a job on the TV show Planet Sheen for Nickelodeon. Jimmy Neutron, got it. Yeah, exactly! And, you know what? I'm doing you a favor today, so I want you to do me a favor and read two screenplays that I've written. Excuse me? That's the end of my story, and I, I swear, it's all the truth. Uh, that's, that's really awesome. So, do any memories stick out to you during your time at the animation studio, or what about being on the side of the live action portion? Oh! We did the live-action portion of that project. Uh, Rocky Solotov, Swampy Marsh, and I formed a partnership, and Rocky and his cronies did the live-action. Uh, meanwhile, they shoved my ass over to Korea to do the animation part. We kinda got screwed over, I'm gonna be 100% honest with you. The animation is not so good, and we got the best thing in the world on it, yet the overseas studio in Korea, they kind of screwed us over because they said, Oh, we've done this, we've done that, so I go over there, I walk into this giant empty room, and I said, uh, You told me you had a studio, motherfucker. Pardon my language. That's okay. And he says, Yes, Mr. Layman. So, uh, when working on the Toon Maker series, do you remember any of the names of the live action characters? Like, like their human names? Because uh, a lot of people have questions about it. Okay, I know, uh, I don't know the names offhand, but there were five girls. There is the blonde girl who was good looking. Uh, I actually 
took her to dinner. She ended up getting a job on Melrose Place, and the black girl ended up uh, starring in the movie Starship Troopers with Denise Richards. The red-haired girl moved on to something. Uh, the other girl uh, worked on Saved by the Bell with Tiffany Amber Thiessen there. The Asian girl, uh, she went on to, she she became a model. She wasn't like a, like a Playboy model, but she did bikini modeling or something like that. All five of them were very successful, and me and Rocky handpicked them all. As a matter of fact, so I've had a pretty great life. That's really great to hear. Right? For sure. Uh, how old are you? Um, 29. So half my age. I, I just turned 60, but you know, <laughs> I look 37, so that's, you know, so that's, uh, well, that's what's important. Yeah. Young jeans. Uh, you know, do you know what I look like? Oh, I was actually sent a photo of all of you guys from- Just pull up my name, go Google my name, and then click on images, you'll see what I look like. Um... What, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> my wife, Jesus Christ, she scared, she scared me. She just showed up right next to the car. <laughs> okay, uh, I only have a few more questions left, but uh, this one's uh, kind of random. Uh, you know the girl who was in the wheelchair on set? Do you remember if she was supposed to have an Australian accent? <laughs> no, she was uh, not. She was uh, she was she was from North Hollywood, and she could walk. Uh, <laughs> listen, let me call you back later. Okay. We got we got a big basket of groceries here. We're in the parking lot. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Uh, can I call you tonight? Yeah. That works. How about we make an appointment? It's uh, one o'clock. Uh, how about I call you at four o'clock? All right, I'll be here. All right, Raven. Bye bye. Bye. Oh no. As soon as Raymond asked to call back at a later time, something in my soul felt very uneasy. I waited until 4 o'clock that evening, and as you could imagine, I never ended up hearing back from him. Until some weeks later. And that portion of the interview I unfortunately don't have recorded here for you today. It was very brief. And to be completely transparent, whatever else that transpired in our follow-up interview were details that I felt only created more confusion in a sea of so much misinformation. I couldn't believe it. I now had a better understanding of Ian's warning. Raymond was definitely one of the most eccentric characters I'd encountered so far. The whole conversation was disjointed, grandiose, and a little rude. It felt impossible to decipher what was fact versus fiction. While some things he had mentioned did seem to line up with what I had gathered from previous interviews, much of his own personal story seemed way too far-fetched to be entirely true. Raymond seemed to take personal ownership over everything that went on at Toon Makers, claiming to have been responsible for much of the management and production, despite his role as animation producer. He frequently fell off topic and name-dropped celebrities irrelevant to our conversation, which almost felt like the stories were thrown in as a way to vouch for his character. When asked specifically about the Toon Makers team, Raymond painted his colleagues as completely incompetent, elevating his own work. There was definitely some resentment there, and it was hard to say whether or not it was unfounded or rooted in some ugly truth. Raymond continued to tell me that even if he did retrieve the tape, sharing the pilot would be impossible due to it being owned by Renaissance Atlantic. But when I had mentioned that it would be likely Renaissance Atlantic president Frank Ward would give him direct permission to release it, considering he himself had shared Team Angel some years back, the conversation began to wane. Whenever a possible solution had been presented, it was very quickly shut down. And it was through these back and forths that I started to come to some pretty heavy conclusions. Perhaps the rumor of Raymond being in possession of this lost media was in fact untrue, and it was now being used as more or less something to keep people hanging on. With so many other people questioning him about the pilot, and with all the years he's been in contact with Frank, how is it that this conversation never came up? If the community believes Raymond has it, he will continue to be a person of interest, and his name will continue to circulate. It was becoming all too much to dissect, and I left that interview with a lot more questions than answers. 
I felt as though I had to take his word with an absolute grain of salt, and this only became more abundantly clear to me when, some weeks later, I would end up receiving an anonymous letter that only further highlighted my concerns about Raymond. Good morning, Raven. I first of all wanted to thank you for putting so much time, effort, and 90s kid heart into your new Sailor Moon documentary and uncovering some very interesting new information about Tomb Maker's Sailor Moon for our community. Along with personally thanking you, I also wanted to connect with you to share some information you may not have heard about the production cells and Raymond. I've been a big fan of Sailor Moon since I was 8, and over the past 20 years, I've collected off and on different collectibles from the show. One of the most prized parts of my collection are my production cells, both from Toei and Tomb Makers, and on the the Toon Maker side of things, I own 46 production cells and 50 production sketches that were used in the making of the pilot. I acquired the cells and sketches in October or November of 2012 when a fellow Sailor Moon cell collector named Cutie Bunny alerted and posted on SailorMoonForum.com about hundreds of cells and sketches from the pilot, along with the script for the animated portions of the pilot popping up for sale on eBay. They were mainly sold by eBay sellers Kitty and Charlie. Vintage Junkstar, and a few others. They also had production sales for sale at the same time from other projects Raymond had worked on, like Street Fighter 2 and Darkstalkers. As many of us were curious as to why all of these sales were mysteriously popping up from Rayman Iokovachi's private collection, that's what the sellers had in their auctions on eBay, we tried to do some digging. When I personally reached out and visited one of the sellers, he said that the reason these items were all popping up for sale was because Raymond was arrested on charges of assault and battery on his male roommate. He's a supposedly could not cover the costs of damages he needed to pay in court, so he allowed all of the items in his storage locker to be sold off to cover the costs, including all of the Tomb Maker Sailor Moon production materials. The eBay seller I messaged told me that he and other eBay sellers from there acquired the production cells and the script themselves at a swap meet in California. They were confused at first, as the cells looked like they were from Sailor Moon, but they looked just a bit different. They did some research into it and figured out that they had found something quite special and acquired the cells to then resell on eBay. That same seller told me in our private messages that Raymond pretty much lost everything because of those charges and court case. When the Tomb Maker's Sailor Moon cells were first posted for sale on eBay, he even tried to reach out to the sellers to get his baby pictures back, as those were also in his storage locker. However, sadly, those had already been thrown out by whoever first emptied the storage locker and brought the items of value to the swap meet. That seller said the last day had heard, Raymond had become pretty destitute and moved back in with his parents in Florida. This would be a very clear explanation of why you haven't been able to get a hold of him as he wants to stay out of the public eye. Thanks again for everything you've already done for us. I truly appreciate it. What I read in that email only served to support my deepest fears that had been festering in my mind ever since my interview with Raymond. It was beginning to look more and more as though Raymond no longer had a copy of this lost pilot and that it had actually been sold, damaged, or lost when the contents of his California locker were emptied and auctioned off back in 2012. Perhaps we'll never know the truth surrounding the rumor of the tape in the Philippines, but I knew at this point I didn't have enough energy to continue speculating. There was more work that needed to be done. Sure, Raymond's testimony added a lot of confusion into the mix, but there was obviously some truth sprinkled into his statements. Just how much? I couldn't be sure. I do appreciate, though, that he was able to provide more clues on the remaining cast members, notably what came of the careers of some of the actresses. That information would prove to be worth investigating further. According to Raymond, after shooting the pilot, Danny had gone into modeling, Stephanie had appeared on an episode of Melrose Place, and the unnamed actress who played Sailor Venus supposedly appeared on Saved by the Bell as one of the bit girls. A new detail about Sailor Venus's actress would surely help to narrow down my future search. So in the end, my time with Raymond was definitely important nonetheless, and I do appreciate the time he took to speak with me, as sporadic as that whole interaction was. And at the end of the day, there was still one thing left to do. Have my sit down with Rocky and the mysterious man in red. Finally, Everything had been leading up to this very moment, and perhaps my interview would serve to further connect the lost pieces of this very peculiar puzzle. 
Before we continue, I'd like to ask that you please take a moment to like and subscribe to the channel. These documentaries are the most creative and in-depth content I've been able to make so far. And while they're rewarding and a lot of fun, they do come at a bit of a cost. They can be incredibly time-consuming to piece together, and even staying away for more than just a few weeks and not posting can severely affect a person's visibility in the YouTube algorithm. If you're enjoying the Tales of the Lost series and want to help keep it alive, your subscriptions and channel support can make all the difference. I'm currently trying to reach 100,000 subscribers in the next couple of months, and a higher view and sub count could help to bring in more sponsorships that can, in turn, support these higher quality documentaries. That being said, if you'd like to go a step further than just liking and subscribing, it would mean a tremendous amount if you joined my community over on Patreon. Pledging as little as a dollar a month, you'll not only be helping to support myself and my work, but a pledge will also grant you special access to our Discord server, where you can meet and connect with other members of our Lost Media and Gaming community. You can hang out in the general chat, share artwork and memes, and even suggest Lost Media topics that you'd like to see covered in future documentaries. Patrons will receive receive early access to videos, previews, and more behind-the-scenes content. If you'd like to pledge or read more information, you can head over to patreon.com slash raymona or click the link provided in the description box below. Thank you so much for your time, love, and support. And now, back to part two of the Western world of Sailor Moon. The weeks that passed since our initial contact had seemed to have flown by, and shortly after my encounter with Raymond, the day of my big interview had finally arrived. Not only was I going to have a chance to sit down with Rocky Solotov himself, the CEO of Tune Makers and the executive producer of Saban Moon, but also an entirely new lead, the producer of live action. The personal overseer of everything that took place on set when shooting the live action portion of the pilot episode. Surely being this close to the project, he would have a ton of new stories to share, and maybe even still be in possession of some keepsakes from the show. And now, we find ourselves back at the start, where I sat in my chair gleefully and in awe of the message I had received from the man in red a couple of months prior. After reaching out with the help of Lynn Walsh, I had finally heard back from the son of her mentor, a man by the name of Stephen Wiltzbach. Daytime Emmy Award winner and film producer Stephen Wiltzbach, who worked on classic films like The Iron Giant, Osmosis Jones, Space Jam, and Fern Gully The Last Rainforest. A man with so many notable works in his film catalog, I never would have guessed would have had a hand at producing the lost live-action Sailor Moon pilot. There was a good chance that in less than a few short hours, many of my deepest questions would finally be answered. I had high hopes for my interview with Rocky and Steven. Maybe they would be able to help me fill in the gaps with all these new leads I uncovered. Maybe this whole thing could be wrapped up into a nice little package, and much of this mystery could finally be laid to rest. So many untold secrets and stories regarding the project, straight from the minds of the most major part of Saban Moon's production. I couldn't let go of the possibility that finding this lost media might be closer than I realized. Someone here must know something. And our time together went a little something like this. I wanted to start off by saying thank you so much for sitting down with me and having this conversation. I'm sure you guys probably get a lot of questions about Sailor Moon on a regular basis. It's just that there's a lot of people out there that are really eager to hear what both of you have to say uh, about your time working on this project. Well, it's odd. It's really odd that there's like a cult with this thing. It's very strange, yeah. It's really grown into its own sort of thing. I think because it's become such an anomaly among fans because there's already such a large cult following for Sailor Moon in general. So anything that's ever been connected to the project, people just soak it in. Yeah, because my company's name appears at the end of the footage that you've got. I get two, three calls a month. Really? Yeah. 
Some people even did their own research to find the new phone number, and they always ask, you have a copy of the whole thing? And my answer is no, and even if I did, I don't own it. I was work for hire, so was Steve. We got the project and our job was to take it and run with it. We both did. While we were both working. Yeah. Working at a place called Bear Animation, that's B-A-E-R, and Dale Bear is considered one of the best animators that ever lived, and we were both working in just a little independent place, a commercial house, and that's where we met, Rocky and I. I was raised in animation, and I wasn't a live action guy. My dad was a Disney animator, or assistant actually. So both Rocky and I were both animation folks, I was an animation camera operator, and Rocky was a production manager. I saw you both had a very large backlog of films, whether it be Five O Goes West, The Little Mermaid. It seems like you guys have both been deep within the animation community for a very long time. Do you happen to remember what the first project was where you both met each other? Well, I'd been working a lot before my time at Bear Animation. I started when I was 18 years old, so we'd both been in it for around 30, 40 years. Something like that. He means to say we don't look old. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what we were working on when I first got there. Do you remember, Rocky? We were working on... Oh, I know. It was Prince and the Pauper. Oh, that's the Mickey Mouse movie, right? Yes. And some scenes from Little Mermaid, yeah. On our resumes, you'll see a lot of movies because as camera operators, we shot a lot of different stuff. We worked for lots of different independent studios and then things like Filmation and Hanna-Barbera. So sometimes you get credit on these, sometimes you don't, depending on if they're a union house or not. Then we both moved. After Bear, I started working for Warner Brothers in feature animation. I was head of scene planning on Quest for Camelot and then The Iron Giant. Ah, The Iron Giant. Yeah, I love Iron Giant. That's uh, probably my favorite movie I've worked on. And then Osmosis Jones, and then I became the associate producer there, and we did Eight Crazy Nights, Looney Tunes Back in Action, and the SpongeBob SquarePants movie. Wow. So I was just associate producer, and then afterwards I went off to TV for one year. I figured both Rocky and I were mostly featured guys, but I wanted to do TV for one season, so I went to work on a Discovery Kids show known as Tootenstein, and uh, we won an Emmy for that one. I hired a bunch of out-of-work featured guys, so for a while they had the best crew in the freaking world for about a year because they were all out of work. Yeah, well... What we've always said is we hire our friends, then we hire friends of friends, and then we hire people that can actually do the job. <laughs> <laughs> so while we were there, Rocky and I got the Sailor Moon pitch, so we did it on the side. And he asked me if I wanted to do live action, and I said, sure, what the heck, I'll try it. I had done a little bit in cable, and I was between animation jobs, so I said, yeah, I'll try the live action. So we just teamed up and did that. It was fun. It was kind of fun. <laughs> we had a lot of very gifted people who pretty much put it together on the way home from their day jobs. Yeah. Everybody was working on the side. Did we work weekends at the sound studio? We shot on the weekends because that way, we didn't get a whole day to shoot the live action. But I had a studio on Chandler Boulevard, and just up the boulevard was Film Roman, where they were doing The Simpsons. So a lot of the guys, Dale Hendrickson, Swampy Marsh, Dan Povenmire, and a couple of the other guys, the pilot was on the way home. They'd stop by, do some drawings, pick up some drawings, and then the next day they'd come back and give us what they had. But all that stuff was done freelance. We had a budget of like, uh, a dollar. For what they wanted, they wanted a lot. And I had been with Saban for like five years and I got 250 hours of television. And I was the guy that every time they had a brilliant idea, they'd ask, oh, Rocky actually knows about animation. Maybe we should give it to him. There wasn't an animator there, not one. Great artist, but nobody animated. So anytime something had to be done, especially something they hadn't done before, I wound up doing it and it was great fun. And I met more great people. Basically, we're migrant workers with pencils. <laughs> Plus, there was a great pub across the street. We had a lot of production meetings there. Oh, yeah. And a nearby golf course where it could kill an afternoon. <laughs> So first, we'll just kind of touch up on the show. We had international call-outs for actresses to play the five parts, and we rented an apartment across the bowling alley by the park, and the day of the first audition, they were wrapped around the block. Whoa. Sailor Moon was pretty well known at the time, and of course, we had every ethnic group, and they had to be young, though they had to be over 18, so they don't have to deal with 16-year-olds. You know, all the child problems. So they had to be over 18, but look 16, you know, or something like that, and that was hysterical. I don't remember how long we did that for maybe a week there were thousands of them and we found our five i think we had a pretty good crew actually the girls were good the girls were great yeah didn't one of them go off to be pretty well known was it tammy adrian george we had one that went on to do starship troopers yes that was tammy adrian she had played sailor jupiter beautiful girl they were all really pleasant she was skilled 
we had a good crew. No, it, it was a great bunch of people. And like I said, we did it all on a shoestring budget, but we worked really hard. We had a director who thought we had a Star Wars budget for the live action. <laughs> was that my friend? What was his name? I don't remember. I think I was trying to remove him from my mind. Good looking, dark haired guy, right? Yeah. And a pill. Actually, what was it that made you guys decide to turn it into a live-action hybrid with animation? Was that something requested by Toyei, or was that a concept of your own? That was a request. Whether it was Toei, or Frank, or Haim Saban, it just came down that this is what we want, and we said, okay. And in the script, we had to make sure that when they would do their twirl, they would twirl into animation. So we had a special effects crew, and we'd have to go back and forth from live-action to animation. And we also have to remind ourselves, we went through with SAG really bad because we hired SAG actresses that this one's not for air. This is literally a proof of concept. So we just wanted to buy them out so there would be no residuals. You know, if the pilot sells, then hopefully you girls will be available to come back, but there's never a guarantee. This is a one-off and not to be seen by anybody who wasn't in the loop. And after it was canned, I put the music video portion on my reel, which we sent out to anybody who wanted to see what we could do. And somebody found it on the reel, and the next thing you know, it's in the air. It's on the computer. People laughing at it. And that's when the phone starts lighting up. You have a copy of the whole thing? No? There must be one somewhere, but I don't know where it might be. I have turned things inside out and found nothing. We did make copies, though. We should have the whole thing. Yeah, the last thing I saw was a VHS tape with one of those little red dots on it. And I've been looking for that red dot for a long time. And I'm sure that the people that we worked with and the contracts that we signed with those people, if they're not dead, they ought to be. <laughs> <laughs> so how much of it did you actually see? Oh, so there was this video and it spread all throughout the internet because someone was at an anime convention at a panel hosted by Alan Hastings who said he worked on the CGI portions. He actually showcased the two minute music video, somebody recorded it and posted it to the internet. Oh. Well, that's interesting because at the end of the tape, it says presented by Tune Makers, made in Hollywood, California. <laughs> So we thought it was dead. You know, I kept a whole notebook of production since I was producing live action. So I had a big old giant notebook of everything that we did with the script. I had everything from the calls, budgets, and storyboards. I had the whole thing and I remember looking at it about, I don't know, maybe six, seven years ago. I thought to myself, well, no one will want to see this again. And I think I tossed it. Oh no. <laughs> I mean, I had all that stuff in there and I hadn't looked at it in years and it just kept gathering dust. So I thought, who's ever going to want to see this, you know? And then Raymond stop the payments on a storage unit here and like in the TV show Storage Wars somebody bought it and a lot of the cells backgrounds and stuff like that he had in there. There's actually this rumor that he has the 17 minute pilot episode in a storage locker in the Philippines but I can't confirm that or not. It's a possibility as he lived in the Philippines for a long time. You know once again we don't own the rights to it and Frank Ward God bless his blue eyes he would come after you in a wink of an eye. You think so? Maybe. The problem is he doesn't even remember doing Sailor Moon. Yes, he remembered Team Angel, and I remember reading in the Kotaku article that he couldn't recall the Sailor Moon project. It was a blip on his radar because he had hired us to do it and he wasn't around all that much. Yeah, I think he came down to the set once. Yeah, that was a fun shoot, and the voiceover sittings were really fun. It's fun working with Adrian. Oh yeah, there was a photo that was shared with all of you guys, the whole cast with Adrian Barbeau. I remember somebody had contacted Tammy Adrian George to ask her about the live-action Sailor Moon, and she said that there were a lot of costumes fittings. Do you guys remember those costumes? Did the actors wear any of their sailor uniforms in the live action portion? It seems to me there was a costume thing. Oh yeah. We know we had them in several different costumes. They had their pajama costumes and their outfits for the dance portion. Then there were these uniforms made for the schoolhouse. I wish I had the storyboard in front of me. How long ago was that? A long time ago. Well, the story of this set is really interesting because I remember when I spoke to Lynn, she told me that you guys filmed at the same location they filmed Saved by the Bell. Did you end up reusing the Saved by the Bell sets or did you add on to it or create your own? We did. We filmed that. I think it might have been the same place they did the Lone Ranger, Rocky. We did Saved by the Bell there at the old place off of Gower. Oh, Sunset Gower Studios. Maybe, because we got a really good deal on it and it was totally empty when we got it. We just built. Yeah, I think we might have. I think we might have utilized the school, if I recall. We used a hallway for the school. A good friend of ours, Scott McCarter. He was a floor manager. He handled all the sets and the lighting guys. Actually, he got most of those lighting guys. He was shooting television at the time, and he was a camera operator as well. And we called him, and I said, I need a crew, and I need some sets. And he said, sure. And I said, Scott, use your gray Scottish form of being thrifty to get these guys to work. And he did. And I think we shot three days of live action. Yeah, it was intense. We had a lot to do in a very short time. 
Just on a side note, Lynn. Love Lynn. Lynn was my dad's animation assistant. She was great, so I hired her. I think I hired her a couple times at Warner Brothers. When she moved back east, I gave her the desk that Chuck Jones signed, and she took the desk all the way back to Boston. We stopped using animation desks, so she got them. And it just sits on her desk now. After the earthquake, for some reason or another, my studio had no damage. But Film Roman, on the other hand, was devastated. It was bad. You couldn't even go in. And the same thing happened with Bill Croyer. We had just finished doing the Page Master and had a big studio to work on that. And then everybody was done with the projects and went on their own way and left all this room with all this equipment in it. And Bill said he needed a place to stay. He was in the middle of doing Peter and the Wolf. So they came over to the studio and they filmed like a little documentary of what they were doing. But once again, it's just all people that we rubbed elbows with on a hundred different projects. Some of our guys who were working on the Page Master were also working on Fern Gully in their spare time. So it's just one of those things where as long as you give me the footage at the end of the week that you're supposed to give me. I don't care if you don't show up and tell them. <laughs> so it seems like there was a lot of crossover. Does that mean that Chuck Jones or maybe Bill and Sue Croyer, did they get to see snippets of the Toon Maker's Sailor Moon project at all since they were also in the studio? I don't think so. They were busy. They were up to their necks and what they were doing, trying to get their studio rebuilt while they were basically stuck with us. Which was fine. There's no sense in square footage going to waste without the sound of pencils, which can be deafening at times. Oh yeah, the sound of all those pencils drawing different cells. All those animators with the headphones on, drooling on themselves. When you guys worked on set, whether it was the live action sets or in the studio, do you two have any memories that stood out? I have a funny story. What's the name of the blonde? Anyways, I came onto the set one morning and one of the girls comes up and says, you gotta help. I forgot her name. I said, where is she? She goes, she's in the closet. <laughs> I said, what? So she got stage fright. She was in the closet crying, you know, like in the fetal position. And I had to go in there and close the door. She said, close the door. I go, what's the matter? She says, I can't do this. And so she was so afraid that she wasn't going to be good. She was really good, you know? And she had all these insecurities, the poor thing. And she was just weeping in the closet. I had to like talk her off the cliff. Like, no, you're great. Everyone loves you. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, this poor thing. But you know, she basically came out and was fine. Yeah, these girls were sensitive because they were hoping the pilot was going to go through and they wanted it to be good. Because if it did go through, then it would have been a big deal, you know? I wonder if any of them are aware of the fact that there's so many people fascinated by this pilot. All they'd have to do is a little Google search to see that there's so many people anticipating Saban Moon. Even though it's been so many years, there's still a lot of people there that would really love to see it. Yeah, every once in a while, there's either a phone call or an email from a fan, and it always starts out with, I know you can't really sell it, but do you have it? Well, I think it's great now with all the CGI stuff and all the superhero stuff that's out now. I think they could probably pull it off and do something really interesting with it. Yeah, I feel like it definitely definitely still has a place because even with shows like Power Rangers, I remember when that show came out, everybody loved it. And even though people kind of saw it as a little bit hokey, it survived for so long. There's even new Power Ranger stuff coming out, even a Netflix series, I believe. Yeah. When Haim sold Fox Family to Disney, he had to sign a non-compete agreement. So for like five years, he didn't make anything new. And then once that agreement was up, he went right back to Power Rangers. And he made a fortune. It's really grown into something else. He always came to work in a limousine and he had a bodyguard with him all the time and he would come in and we were riding in the elevator once. We were going to do some recording for a show called Flint the Time Detective. He looked over at me and he goes, you work for me? And I said, yeah, and I produce some of your animation. He goes, you must be doing a great job. I asked what makes you think that, and he goes, I have no idea who you are. <laughs> <laughs> So, I know that the script has found its way online, but would you be able to share any more details about the plot to the Toon Maker series? Did you guys conceptualize anything beyond the pilot? Well, we watched the original till our eyes bled trying to find a way to Americanize this because the cultural difference between Japan and here is so broad. That's why early anime dubs are goofy, because you don't know what certain cultural nuances mean, so you slap some words together and make it funny. The cultural difference was a chasm in some cases. We had some ideas, Tuxedo Mask was at the boys school on the other side of the river. So the girls were interact with the boys because they were at the girls' school. So we made a boarding school across the river. It was basically, we got to go save the world in every episode. But then we go back to being fun-loving girls. And there's some kind of a romantic thing going on with Tuxedo Mask. Would you happen to remember what their human names were? Because we know of Sailor Moon, Mercury, Mars, but a lot of people were curious about what their human names would have been. I don't remember. Me neither. I can't remember their real names or if they even had human names in the pilot. Yeah, I think they just called each other by their planetary names. I'm sure we named them, but I don't recall that. <laughs> 
credited as girl in closet. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have a Sailor Moon toy still in a box somewhere in a little compact case with the ruby in it. And if you pushed it, it lit up. So we have the toys. I gave it to my grandson Argus and my daughter. And that was the last time I saw it. Were those toys made for the live action series? Yeah, they were prototypes. Oh my God. Gosh, that is so cool. There was a lot of lost stuff, yeah. There was one prototype from the Toon Maker's pilot that somehow managed to get past Bondi and was eventually sold as the Moon Cycle. A lot of people growing up were like, wait a minute, this doesn't appear in the anime? And when doing research on this, I found out it was rumored to be a Toon Maker's prototype concept. Is that true, or...? Yeah, that was us. Did we make something? No, we didn't prototype it, we drew it. And the girl with the red hair, we also gave her a wheelchair. And we were as politically correct as you could be at the time. We had an African American, a Chinese girl, we had a Hispanic girl, we had a blonde girl, and a redhead in a wheelchair. Yeah, it was tricky to cast that. Like I said, we had to find girls that looked real young, that fit the type, but we had to be a little careful with stereotyping and all sorts of stuff. And then when we drew them, we didn't draw them like anime. We had to change them. We sort of wondered if it was gonna fly or not. You know, they were Americanized, obviously. That was their mark instructions, live action and make them look more like He-Man. Yeah, some fans joked it was the original She-Ra, which I thought was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, well that was what they wanted. And for the budget they gave us, they were lucky they even got that. For the type of animation that Steve and I were capable of doing, they wanted this instead. But they were paying, so we did it, and we hoped that it would catch on. Yeah, even considering the budget you guys had, honestly, I think it came out pretty well because despite the video where there's people laughing at it, those people in particular are very much, you know, those critical anime fans. But if you ask a bunch of girls or people who grew up with shows like The Sky Dancers or even She-Ra, I feel like we totally would have watched it and the reception would have been slightly different. Well, we can bring the best animators in the world there if we had the budget, you know? It's all about time and money. And it was the beginning of CGI and special effects and the internet was all very new. Our hands were tied somewhat, you know, because we had so much going on. Like the cat wrangler on set. <laughs> <laughs> that goddamn cat. <laughs> was the cat hard to deal with? If I recall, the cat was not the most, uh, pleasant animal. It was kind of feisty. The guy gave him sedatives, and it was like playing with a rag doll. Yeah, yeah, we didn't drug him. <laughs> that thing, he, he peed everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> And then I had to go to Korea to finish the film because it was still being animated. It was a lot of favors, a lot of people to do work for us, but when push comes to shove, animators are masochistic. They'll take on as much work as they possibly can because they know that it's gonna eventually dry up. If you're really good and you finish faster than they think, you're out of work. Yeah, I know animation can be very demanding. I've heard a lot of stories. So I can imagine with a project like this, with that kind of budget, the amount of hoops you guys had to jump through just to get things done. Especially if these animators were working on other things. They would do it at night. We had to have certain amounts of footage. They had to work every week to hit our deadlines. And it got real tight financially as well. But in the end, we wound up with hats. Yeah, we got hats. Do you still have your hat? Such a wonderful color. It really shows off your wig. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'm gonna look around in my studio and see what I can find. I don't remember if I tossed all that stuff or not. I think I went through it and got rid of some stuff as it got really junky, but I might have kept some things. And if I did, I'll call you, okay? Yes, that would be amazing. If you could call, email, I'll pick up regardless. Okay, yeah, I'll let you know if I find anything. Cause my dad, when he passed, he left a whole bunch of boxes that I have in the garage of stuff that he worked on. And they sold some of it, you know, a lot of collectors and stuff grabbed some items. And I've tons of stuff that no one's ever gonna use. There might be something that you might want from this lot. It's been sitting in boxes for years and it's not stuff that I can sell anymore because people are mostly buying set up colored cells now and drawings. My dad worked on the Mickey Mouse Club and when he was at Disney, one of his jobs in the summer between seasons was cleanup. So he was throwing out all these cells in the trash and they weren't worth anything back then in the 50s and 60s. So occasionally he'd grab a scene or two and just take it home for the kids, you know? So he was working on Lady and the Tramp, 101 Dalmatians and Sleeping beauty and he just grabbed stuff and bring it home and put it on our walls as kids. It wasn't worth anything at the time. He'd grab some scenes that he drew of Mickey Mouse, would frame them, and give them away to friends as gifts. Yeah, we used to give the original drawings to the neighborhood kids and they'd take them home and color them in with crayons. I distinctly remember I've got a drawing of Mickey Mouse grinding an old time camera and the crocodile looking up from Peter Pan licking his chops to eat Captain Hook. These have become my prized possessions. It's the only thing that we really get that reminds us what we did. Of all the cells in my office, I 
I've got cells from pretty much everything I worked on, tucked away and hanging on the walls. But I figure it, it'll at least put my great-granddaughter through college one day. I know that there's a lot of doll collectors for Sailor Moon as well. It actually has a very huge doll collecting community. I feel like a lot of the gadgets from the pilot, like the hang gliders or Queen Barrel's ship, if they were toys, I feel like they would have sold out pretty well. Can you remember any more prototypes you'd drawn that weren't in the pilot? Not really. The sky gliders or sails on a surfboard, that was one idea of how they can get around in outer space. And the other one was flying the wheelchair, which when they're gonna fight evil off the planet, you've gotta have a way to get there. Rocky, wasn't your team drawing up toy concepts for the cat? And weren't there some school or fashion stuff that they were drawing up? It wasn't us. It might have been Bandai. They handled most of their toys, then they got in a bidding war with Deke and Saban. Yeah, that is interesting though, how that one toy managed to get past production and onto the store shelves. Even I have a moon cycle. Okay, so this is probably going to be an easy one, but it was rumored that there was behind the scenes footage for the making of Pilot. Would you be able to share any of that additional behind the scenes footage for the purposes of this documentary? No, because we never saw it. There was a guy there who had a little handheld video camera and he was documenting the making of for whatever reason. I don't know, but I think he was hired by Renaissance Atlantic. Yeah, he came in and shot it, but we never saw the final piece. Oh, do you remember what his name was? No, we didn't nope. even know him. He was essentially hired to document stuff, so he wasn't really part of our crew. Oh, so I imagine if it blew up, then it would have become footage for a behind the scenes featurette like you'd often see with Disney films. Yes, I think that was the idea in case the show got the green light then they would have the making of for the pilot. I think that's what it was meant for, but we didn't know whether it would ever be a thing. The guy, well, he just got in the way. Yeah. <laughs> He didn't even take a lens cap off. <laughs> so I guess to branch off of that, and I think I already know your answer, but people were wondering if it was possible to showcase the 17 minute pilot. But from what we've talked about earlier, I know that that's not in either of your possession. Not at this point. And I know I've looked several times, but it's always in the last place you look. Because once you find it, you stop looking. I don't have one. Raymond may have one. I mean, the whole Philippines thing, that's a possibility, but God knows what happened happen to that. Frank Ward may have one, Rocky talks to him, I don't, so. Trust me, if we do find it, you'll be the second to know. A lot of amazing talent has come from and worked alongside Toon Makers and Renaissance Atlantic. Do you guys ever look back fondly or feel a sense of pride knowing that you've housed so many creatives who went on to produce their own works? I feel like there's so much budding talent in the animation industry, and a lot of the times it just takes for one person in a position of authority to really take a chance on them and give them the tools that they need to really thrive in the industry. Yeah, absolutely. In my case, I was in management. As a producer, I had a lot of people below me and they were called assistant production managers and a lot of these people went off to become producers themselves and very successful at that so it happens all the time a lot of the animators end up becoming directors and got famous that way you know swampy marsh and dan poppenmeyer this morning i got a picture on my phone of swampy in his green hat so those guys the two of them went on to do rocker's modern life phineas and ferb and they're the only people i've worked with that walk around in the disney parks yeah i've worked with tom cito he's a director on osmosis jones he's now considered the old Old, wise man of animation as he's an animation historian of the business now he's now a professor at usc as well yeah and there's brad bird he's the head of pixar now yeah he was really fun to work with on iron giant that was a guy that really knew his stuff you could just tell he wanted to stay at warner brothers but they didn't have another movie for him and i thought you guys are so stupid for letting him go he pitched the show to them, and they said, no, no, we're not doing animation anymore. So he went over to Pixar, pitched the show to them. I, I think it did pretty well. It was called The Incredibles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Brad turned out to be very successful. One of the best in the world. I still think Iron Giant's the best movie nobody's ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we actually managed to get through all of the major questions. So I decided to pull some questions from Twitter, and we actually got over 40 questions in the last two days, but I narrowed it down to like three or four, if that's okay. The first question is from Freak Fox. They asked, Rocky, I believe you are really forward thinking with trying to make the Sailor Scouts distinct nationalities in your pitch. Was that the plan or did it come to you later in the process? No, that was always part of the plan. It was part of the description we were given. They had to be multinational 
International Politically Correct, and we said sure. Angel wanted to know, if the show were to have been picked up and gone past season one, would the future seasons also have been adapted from the corresponding seasons in the anime, or would it have been entirely different? We had drawn from as much of the anime as we could in order to push the story along, because, well, we're American. We had to kind of change it a little bit. So if there was a following episode, it would have to push the story going forward, going out of character. Yeah, it couldn't be completely different from the pilot, so we probably would have improved the look. Cause like I said, we were on a budget. But if they had picked up the series, it would be on a completely different budget, and the animation would have probably been improved a lot. Whether they would have kept the same girls or not, that remains to be seen too, you never know. So it's kind of a hard thing to answer. If they liked the style, they probably would have kept the style, but they might have changed the girls. They might have added more CGI, it's hard to say. This one's from Jax Poole, and Jax Poole asked, What was the inspiration behind casting actress Adrian Barbeau to voice both Queen Serenity and Queen Beryl? Money! <laughs> she could do two voices. And according to the Screen Actors Guild, <laughs> I can use one actor to do three voices on an episode and still pay them the same amount of money. She was great fun to work with too. Well, I guess that wraps up this interview. This was a lot of fun, you guys. And thank you so much for sitting down to talk with me about this. I know a lot of people are gonna be pretty excited. Oh, well, good. I appreciate that. When you put the next one together, let us know. My interview with Steven and Rocky was incredibly refreshing to say the least. It was great getting to hear all the stories of two animators who had very long careers in the industry, along with their personal behind the scenes insight on the production of Saban Moon. Rocky and Steven seemed to enjoy reminiscing and worked really well off of one another, offering to help fill in each other's gaps as they recounted the events that took place on set and in the studio in 1994. To summarize, here are some of the most crucial takeaways points and newly discovered details regarding the production of Saban Moon that we can take away from our discussion. A lot of very gifted animators worked on the live-action Sailor Moon pilot and would complete this work on their way home from their day jobs. The animation team comprised of friends and former colleagues and people looking to find more work in animation. Among the team were animators Swampy Marsh and Dan Povenmire, the creators behind Phineas and Ferb. Toonmakers was asked specifically to make a He-Man, She-Ra type of hybrid with the budget that they were given, but the budget was incredibly low and as a result, they had to pull a lot of favors to get the pilot finished, even having to complete part of the animation in Korea. Thousands of people showed up for the Sailor Moon casting call, and casting took around a week to complete. The idea for a live-action hybrid was at the request of either Toye, Renaissance Atlantic president Frank Ward, or Haim Saban of Saban Entertainment. After the success of the Power Rangers, Toye wanted to further capitalize on its success by taking their other intellectual properties and Americanizing them, working together with Renaissance Atlantic before deciding to scrap much of these ideas in favor of their original dubs. What other intellectual property from Toye were included in this list? It's really hard to say, but I'd imagine that any Anything produced by Toye around that time had the potential of some sort of Americanized spin-off. The Moon Cycle was a concept drafted by Rocky and his team that somehow managed to carry over to toy shelves after the pilot was scrapped once Sailor Moon was picked up by Deke Entertainment. More toys from Saban Moon do exist as prototypes. There was a transformational compact locket with a ruby in it made just for the pilot, sky gliders made for the Sailor Scouts to travel around in outer space, a wheelchair made for Sailor Mercury, and a handful of Sailor Moon fashion dolls manufactured to look like the Toon Maker's iteration of the characters. Rocky remembers giving an inbox Sailor Moon prototype doll to his daughter and grandson. Bondi was also supposedly drying up more clothing and fashion doll related concepts including toy concepts for Luna the Cat. Steven said he had been in possession of an entire notebook of production for the live-action portion, including everything from call notes, budgets, and storyboards. Sadly, around six to seven years ago, Steven threw out his material while clearing out his storage, figuring no one would be interested in seeing said material. And our final point, there was a behind-the-scenes portion filmed by an individual on behalf of Renaissance Atlantic that would later be used for a making-of video if the series took off. So somewhere out there, a BTS recording of Saban Moon exists. 
Everything I learned during our sit-down made me more appreciative of this lost enigma. So many stories from the cast and crew, and so many dedicated animators wanting to grow in the industry, offering their extra time to try to work on this pilot. And who would have thought the creators behind Phineas and Ferb would have ever been involved in the production of an Americanized Sailor Moon? My sit-down with Steven Wiltzbach and Rocky Solotov had revealed so much about what took place behind the scenes. It seems like the animators and the rest of the crew really wanted to do their best with what they were given, in the hopes that this pilot would be greenlit. I was surprised to learn of all of the physical relics now seemingly lost to time. An entire catalog of storyboards, crew details, and behind-the-scenes footage, along with a limited amount of prototypes presumably long gone and discarded many years ago. I thanked Steven and Rocky for their time, and after our interview, both let me know that if anything else came up on their end, I would be the second to know. All in all, it was an insightful and really heartwarming interview to add to my investigation. But that feeling inside me was still unsatisfied. As grateful as I was to have connected with so many new people involved with Saban Moon, there was a great need to keep exploring. I mean, with everything I knew now, why stop my search? All of this newfound information only gave me more hope that something would eventually turn up. I felt I'd come so much closer than I could have ever expected, and because of this, it just felt like there was still more to be dissected. I wanted to find Saban Moon. I had already spent over seven months researching and trying to uncover more clues, and I felt like at this point, I was already on the cusps of a new discovery. Every new discovery that led to an unanswered question, halves to a whole story, were clues that I had left tucked away in my back pocket to look at once more. I wanted to revisit everything in its entirety, and one comment in particular during my sit down with Rocky and Steven was what really sparked this feeling in me to go back into all of my information a comment that would completely turn my search around and lead me even closer to this truth I'd been chasing for so long. Before completely throwing in the towel, there was something more I had to do. Even though I made so much leeway in my follow-up investigation, the perfectionist in me still felt deeply unsatisfied with my search. In part one of this series, though I was able to find new details about the pilot, I still ultimately came up empty-handed, and I felt like this time around, I didn't want to throw in the towel unless I was able to retrieve something substantial from my search. Knowing that it wasn't just the lost music video and pilot that had been missing, but also that there had been physical prototypes existing at some point and some ultimate show bible only aggravated the thoughts in my mind that wanted me to unearth something. So with all of this new information now at my disposal, I decided to look at everything as a whole, all of the interviews and all of the leads discovered in the hopes of finding a new clue. And reviewing all this evidence for a second time, just like Dale Hendrickson's comment about freelance animators that led me to finding Lynn Walsh, I wound up fixated on a a brief comment from my interview with Steven and Rocky. I thought back to when I had asked the pair if they were in possession of the lost pilot. Rocky remarked that he'd looked several times and couldn't seem to find it, but noted, it's always in the last place you look, because once you find it, you stop looking. That statement echoed in my head. As I looked over my collage of evidence, a mishmash of clues that led to answers and clues that led to roadblocks and even more questions, I thought to myself, where in here have I not looked? Exhaust every resource and leave no stone unturned. And then it hit me. I thought back to a few messages that had gone overlooked throughout my investigative process. Some users had suggested I try my luck at looking into a place known as the Library of Congress, a Washington-based public library consisting of all submitted copywritten material that can be accessed from a physical office and their online database. When looking up the copyrighted works of Renaissance Atlantic, fans had noticed a few entries with the titles Project Y and Sailor Moon, a clue I had almost forgotten during my entire descent into this rabbit hole. Was it possible that the Library of Congress had still retained said copies of these submitted documents? What if the answer was really that simple? 
I ended up searching through the archives, and just like people had said, to my surprise, there were in fact copyright entries from Renaissance Atlantic dating back to 1994. And as I scanned through the list, searching for anything under the titles Project Y and Sailor Moon, I made a disturbing discovery. While I did manage to find some records of Sailor Moon, of the submitted titles were a handful of shows that, to my knowledge, hadn't even been dubbed yet, despite being listed with an earlier copyright date. Some shows, even, had been conceived out of thin air. Wait a minute, was that a sizzle pitch for an early Tamagotchi cartoon? What were they up to? Several shows from Toei Animation seemed to have their own pitch sizzles and drafted scripts, which only confirmed what I had theorized this entire time. After seeing the massive success of the Power Rangers, the Megamind Corporation's Bandai and Toei Animation believed there to be an untapped market for Americanized live-action hybrids and had enlisted the help of Renaissance Atlantic to try and recreate shows from their own existing IP. At some point, many of these pilots had ended up getting rejected, which resulted in their original anime to being dubbed outright. It seems that Toye was looking to capitalize heavily on toy sales and were aiming to make the most money possible. So in some alternate universe, had all of these pitches gone through, anime not only would have taken longer to catch on in the West, but anime itself would have been drastically different from how we view it today. If there had been a market for all of these adaptations, there would have been no reason to dub anime, and some of the biggest, most influential cartoons in Japan would have never had that influential boomerang effect on Western animation. Today, many modern American cartoons are heavily influenced by anime, whether whether it be through characters or style of animation. The relationship between American and Japanese animation would have been so different from what we know today. As someone heavily fascinated by this sort of thing, I was kind of left there in awe at what I had just seen. So many what-ifs were being housed in this archive. I didn't think it was possible for one massively successful Frankenstein creation like the Power Rangers of all shows to have almost altered dubbed anime as we know it. Though this new discovery was tempting me to research further into the what-if scenarios, I knew I had to reshift my focus back onto Saban Moon. Maybe afterwards we could dive deeper into this unexplored rabbit hole. That evening, I called the Library of Congress to see if it was possible to request copies of certain material contained in their office. Unfortunately, while speaking with their secretary over the phone, I was told that in order to obtain the records I had been looking for, I would need written permission from the copyright holder who submitted the files. And wouldn't you know it, the submitter listed on all of the copyrighted material I had inquired about was under the names Renaissance Atlantic and Frank Ward. THE Frank Ward, the now 80-something-year-old business owner who supposedly ruled with an iron fist that Rocky and Steven had mentioned. Frank Ward, producer of shows like Beetleborgs, The Power Rangers, Masked Rider, someone with such close ties to Saban, and the same Frank Ward that shared a lost Americanized Sailor Moon concept known as Team Angel with Kotaku back in 2018. thought back to my conversation with Rocky and Steven, and how they said that Frank Ward had overseen so many projects during his time, and as a result had little to do with the production during his time at Renaissance. And while he was very protective over his intellectual property, there was also a high chance he wouldn't remember working on Sailor Moon. In the Kotaku article of 2018, the discovery of Team Angel only came about when journalist Cecilio D'Anastasio and her team managed to have a sit-down with Frank Ward in their pursuit of Saban Moon. Mistakening Team Angel to be the pilot in question, it came to a surprise to everyone when Frank Ward revealed a VHS that wound up being the trailer to an entirely different pilot. I imagined it would be quite difficult to track him down on my own. What if he forgot once more about the original live-action concept since that interview in 2018? It had been exactly three months since my last documentary, and quickly approaching my own personal deadlines for the second half, I felt increasingly overwhelmed at how all-consuming this project had become. People were expecting a follow-up and a conclusion to my search. Truthfully, the findings I had made so far were adequate enough to be used in my video. But even still, I had this relentless 
urge to hold out just a little longer in the hopes that something would reveal itself. But still, what if this investigation would go on for another three months? Was I in over my head? What I came to find at the library was already an incredible feat. What if it really was possible to get a hold of Frank Ward? That possibility was very real. And if that was possible, what would be a few more weeks of waiting? If Frank didn't respond, or if it turned out there was nothing tangible hidden away at the Library of Congress, I would surely throw in the towel. Even if there was a slim chance, there was now some window of hope that I'd attain access to some Saban Moon-related material. So long as I had permission from people at the top, more specifically, Frank Ward. This really would be the last place I'd look, an archive here, just sitting in plain sight for years. And it's more than likely that no further inquiries have ever really been made because no one really knew where to start. In terms of online activity, Frank Ward didn't have the biggest digital footprint, so I decided to take a chance, delay the release of the documentary for another month, and pursue a new person of interest in my investigation. If I came up empty-handed, at least I could sleep knowing that I tried. My focus had completely shifted, but not onto making contact with Frank Ward, who seemed to be impossible to get a hold of. I ended up shifting my focus to a person that I knew made some sort of contact with him in recent years. The journalist from the 2018 Kotaku article, Cecilia D'Anastasio. At this point in my search, I felt so much growing anxiety. Cecilia was the last known person with direct contact to Frank Ward, with them having a rare sit-down in 2018 and Frank having almost no press interviews around that time. I had suspected he trusted her a great deal, enough so that he felt comfortable sharing Team Angel with her and her crew. If anyone could reach him directly, surely it would be her. In a flash, I reached out on Twitter, explaining who I was and what I had planned to do for my upcoming documentary. Letting her know I read her article back in 2018. After some time had passed, I heard back from her, and we agreed to take our conversation to Discord to sit down for a quick voice call. After spending some time swapping similar stories from our search, I then asked if she would be able to deliver my request to Frank Ward. Cecilia was thrilled and more than happy to help me with my investigation, and had agreed to act as middleman between myself and Frank. She then advised me to prepare a letter outlining who I was and what I had planned to do along with my request. She explained that this would likely make the whole process run so much smoother. Cecilia would call Frank Ward in the morning and explain the whole situation. If he accepted, I would also need to write up a contract, including a list of works in question that I was looking to receive copies of from the library. And if Frank signed it, the rest would be in the hands of the people who worked at the copyright office. As excited as we both were at the prospect of this letter being accepted, we had to keep our expectations measured. There was a good possibility I would find myself paying out of pocket for this exchange, or it was entirely possible that he wouldn't agree to working with me at all. Not being able to speak with him directly, it all boiled down to the contents of my letter. And as I wrote my letter, I hoped my sincerity would shine through. After drafting up my letter for Frank, I then searched through the Library of Congress database and compiled a list of all the works that contained the phrases Project Y, Sailor Moon, and any other titles that sounded remotely related to the pilot. I sent both files to Cecilia that very night and kept my fingers crossed. Sometime later, I received correspondence from Cecilia and was surprised to learn that Frank had agreed to signing my letter. Shortly after, sitting in my inbox was Frank's signed copy of the contract I had written up and sent to Cecilia. I couldn't believe what was happening. It almost didn't feel real. All of these events that had played out had felt as though they sped up in comparison to all my previous months of searching. I started having this euphoric sort of feeling. I felt so hopeful at this point. I was on the cusps of unearthing some sort of chamber of secrets. What if the library was housing the art bible, copies of the material Stephen Wilsbach had discarded years ago? Or what if an actual copy of the pilot was being held in their storage facility? Whatever was in those documents, I would soon be able to see for myself. I didn't waste any time, and as soon as I received Frank's signed copy, I went ahead and forwarded everything to the Library of Congress, including the list of works to be withdrawn. It was time for the biggest waiting game of them all.
The odd thing was, it actually didn't take long to hear back from a representative at the Library of Congress. Yet I would argue that this came to be the most agony-inducing stretch of time I've ever had to sit through, and the wait paled in comparison to the waiting I had done throughout my month-long search. This moment somehow felt different. I was so eager for answers at this point. My adrenaline was skyrocketing and my nights up until receiving that email were filled with restless thoughts. But these feelings would soon come to an end because by the end of the week, a representative from the company had responded to my inquiry. He informed me that Frank's signature had been approved and that there would be an estimated wait time of a little over a week to give staff time to locate and copy said material. Some files would be sent digitally, while others on my list would have to be sent through physical mail. The process of shipping the material physically unfortunately was estimated to take around four weeks, and of course, I would also have to pay a duplication fee in addition to the standard rate they charged for looking through their archives. Whatever it took at this point, I was ready. So I paid the fee and once again waited to hear back from the library staff. Each morning I would frantically check my email and mailbox to see if anything had come through. It became the only thing on my mind. And then, some weeks later, a message popped up in my inbox. What I'm about to share with you is everything the staff was able to release from the files and documents I'd requested from the Library of Congress. Sadly, a good chunk of materials requested had either been lost or misplaced over time, but I hope whatever I've been able to gather and show you today can put some of your anxieties to rest regarding the mysteries behind Saban Moon. The following footage is what I was able to retrieve. Once upon another time, once upon another place, 
Our solar system was besieged. Wicked Queen Beryl and her evil forces of darkness captured the outer planet and seized their jewels of power. The princess warriors ruled Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and the Earth's moon. To become absolute ruler, Queen Beryl must defeat the princess warriors and obtain the remaining cosmic jewels of power. The royal families of the five inner planets, led by beautiful Queen Serenity, formed an alliance to defeat Queen Beryl, making the moon their capital. To affirm the new confederation, Queen Serenity announced the betrothal of her only daughter, Sailor Moon, to Darien, Prince of the Earth. A great celebration was held on the moon to honor the momentous occasion. Sailor Moon was surrounded by her closest friends, the Princess Warriors, Sailor Mars, Sailor Mercury, Sailor Venus, and Sailor Jupiter. Oh, Darian, I've so looked forward to this day. At last we will be together. Darian placed a star pendant around Sailor Moon's neck and presented her with a single rose. A symbol of my everlasting love. A chilling breeze swept the rose from his hand. It's Beryl. The evil beast has found us. Our time is finally at hand. Now the darkness shall have dominion. The solar system is mine. Behold Queen Beryl and despair. Go, my dark minions. Bring me the jewels of power. We must stop them. to your sky flyers the royal families must be saved it's up to you to pilot the galleon I can't leave you now there's no time to argue you must save as many as you can Quickly, take the jewels. You and the other princesses must escape with Darien to Earth. But there's no time to explain. You princesses now possess the most powerful pendants in the universe. Guard them with your lives. Escape into the vortex. There you can hide in a different dimension. Beryl cannot follow. I will find a way to communicate with you. But you must leave now. Too late! Watch out! Look out! No! No! We almost have them! Faster! Faster! To the vortex and beyond oblivion! Oh, Luna. Home seems so far away now. Hey, Vic. Vicky. Victoria. Can I borrow your lipstick? What? Sure. Where are you going? Don't tell me you forgot. Whoa! Oh. There goes there one of my nine lives. lives. The tan! She looks like an angel flying higher than a bird. Sailor! Sailor Moon! She's got a life in the sky and another here on Earth. Sailor! Sailor Moon! Be honest. Should I be smashing and white? Or sophisticated and black. What happened to pretty and pink? Her talking cat Luna gives her advice. The princess fighters stand by her side. Sailor, Sailor Moon. Sailor, Sailor Moon. Mr. T. 
artistically speaking, I am going to find the cutest guy at the dance. I didn't know you are. And why not? Because he'll be dancing with me. <laughs> She's ready to fight for all that she believes. Sailor, sailor moon. She's going to stop evil forces and save the galaxy. Sailor, sailor moon. I have absolutely nothing to work out. Jupiter on their sky flyers to do battle with Queen Beryl's dark forces. So, this is what I missed the dance for? You guys are in for it, and if I break a nail, you're really in for it. Why don't we have a party right here? Sounds good to me, but I think these guys are too out of shape to dance. Why don't we burn off a few pounds? <laughs> A little high voltage, boys. Gangway for the original party girl. Oh, I like your style. Let me teach you a new step. Uh-oh. This creep is mine. Take that, tall, dark, and gruesome. Watch out! Ah! Are you all right? Somebody answer that phone. This one is powerful. Oh, moon is hurt. A rose. Look. Who can it be? I just don't know. I just don't know. Vicky? Victoria? I don't know. I just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you daydreaming this time, Victoria? Outer space? No, Miss Scrum. I'm right here.
Aha! Gotcha! Y'all really thought I was gonna leave you empty-handed. This was really hard to keep a secret. I bet none of you were expecting the full pilot episode to pop up right after the premiere of the music video, huh? See what I did there? I wanted to add a little bit of suspense, so sue me. I mean, the whole thing had come as a shock to me as well, and frankly, my first time watching all of this had felt like some kind of surreal dream. So I did my best to try and replicate that same feeling for people watching at home. And I hope you fell for it. After the 20 plus year long search, Saban Moon had finally been found. Rocky was right, definitely in the last place I looked. I knew if I just held out a little longer with my investigation, my leads would eventually bring me something entirely new regarding the live-action pitch. But I never imagined uncovering the music video and the full pilot all at once. And I really hope you're all still following, as the documentary isn't quite over yet. The pilot, along with the music video, confirms so many more facts about the series, and there's plenty to be observed, too. And you know what we love to do here with new information. It's time to outline all of our new finds, along with checking off facts that can now be fully confirmed. We can finally put a ton of ideas to rest, and I'd like to be the one to set the record straight. So bear with me for a little longer, and more will be revealed. It's time to close things out the right way. <clears throat> From both the pilot and the music video, we can now fully confirm some previous rumors regarding the project, along with there being newly uncovered information about what Tune Maker Sailor Moon would have been. The unique live-action merch confirmed. Just like Rocky had revealed in our sit-down interview, Bondi had prototyped their own unique merchandise and toys to be used for the Americanized pitch. We now have visual evidence of the transformational locket he was referring to. While similar to the American Bondi 1995 locket model, instead of there being a light-up jewel in the center, this version of the toy now has a removable ring in its place that is used to activate Sailor Moon's transformation. These jewel rings are likely the rings of power Queen Beryl is said to be after. Updated lyrics can now be heard. This higher quality music video now reveals the most accurate and up-to-date interpretation of the Saban Moon lyrics, which slightly differs from what had been circulating online all these years. You can find a text version to the full lyrics linked in the description box of this video. New character designs have been revealed. Because we now have the full pilot, we can now view the never-before-seen character designs of Queen Serenity and Prince Darian's alter ego, Tuxedo Mask. It's curious that even though cells from this lost pilot had been circulating all the way back from 2012, these character designs in particular never seem to have surfaced online prior to this finding. Her name is Victoria, the name theory, partially confirmed. We now have further confirmation of the name theory that I hypothesized in part one of this docu-series, that Serena slash Usagi's name in the Tune Maker's pitch was Victoria and had likely been recycled back into the early Deke ad where the character names were drastically different. An ordinary high school girl named Victoria transforms into the superhero known as her friend Blue becomes... Sailor Mercury! Her friend Sarah becomes... Sailor Jupiter! Her friend Dana becomes... Sailor Mars! Her friend Carrie becomes... Sailor Venus! I am now entirely convinced that the other names heard in the deep trailer could have very well been the identities of the rest of the girls in the Tune Maker's pilot, with the exception of Blue. This name still seems like more or less an anomaly amongst the group, and more likely a last minute decision made for the Deke ad because she is quite literally covered head to toe in shades of blue. Unfortunately, we can't fully confirm the remaining names unless we somehow manage to get access to the full Tune Maker script that included the live-action dialogue. I did make an attempt to get my hands on the full script, but sadly, I was notified by the Copyright Congress office that this piece of material in particular had been misplaced within the facility and was unable to be recovered for the time being. But it's good to know that the Deke advert theory I had conceptualized previously was beginning to hold a little more weight. In my interview with Rocky and Steven, they had both recalled giving the cast human names but simply could not remember. 
The musical score sounds similar to work from Bob Summers and Don Perry. While there had been rumors circulating that the Saban Moon theme and soundtrack was composed by musician Ron Wasserman, hearing the background music and cues in the pilot, a lot of comparisons can be made between the pilot's score to the very synth-heavy background music found in the early deep dub of Sailor Moon. Of darkness captured the outer planet and seized their jewels of power. The princess warriors ruled Mercury, Venus. The background music from the deep dub was composed by artists Bob Summers and music producer Don Perry. We can now identify the majority of the cast. Having obtained a higher quality video, it's now easier to identify and confirm the identities of the actresses on screen. With this newfound information, I was able to successfully find full names of all the Sailor Scouts, except for the actress who played Sailor Venus. Her identity still remains a mystery, but for the others, the names Tammy had given me during our interview really helped in narrowing down my search and ultimately played a part in clearing up some cast confusions. With a little bit of cyber sleuthing, I was able to discover that Danny was actually the actress Danny DeLacy who played Sailor Mars. Her only other known acting credit was in the 1995 CD-ROM dating sim game titled Mackenzie and Co. Carly, I have called your help six times! What's wrong? I saw the man! here a half hour ago. Though she played the character known as Kim Lee, she was inaccurately credited as the character Carly Adams. Had I not known her nickname was Danny, I probably would have believed in this error. My search also led me to finding out that the woman known as Mindy, who played Sailor Mercury, was actually Broadway actress Melinda Cowan. She was the only cast member who was reported to be under 18 at the time of filming the pilot. These girls, along with Tammy Adrian George as Sailor Jupiter and Stephanie Dicker as our Sailor Moon, we now had the confirmed identities of four out of the five actresses who played the Sailor Scouts. Finding Sailor Venus proved to be a much more difficult task. Though there were plenty of higher quality screenshots to choose from, she was somehow the hardest to identify. I had spent a good couple of weeks trying to track her down and came close many times, only to discover that it wasn't in fact her. I looked through so many IMDb pages and ended up watching more episodes of Saved by the Bull than I'd like to admit, as suggested to me from a previous lead. But still, nothing. It's weird because out of all the girls, this actress had the most familiar face to me, as if I'd seen her in a Lifetime movie or a teen sitcom of the 90s. In the end, I decided to put an end to my search, as I realized I'd come far enough already. It was time for a break. If the fans wanted to find her, they now had all the tools to do so, and I sincerely hope that someone does. An insightful author once said, Patience is not the ability to wait. Patience is to be calm no matter what happens. Constantly take action to turn it into positive growth opportunities and have faith to believe that it will all work out in the end while you are waiting. It's hard to believe that my search for Saban Moon started less than a year ago and that my months of searching, finding new leads, hitting countless roadblocks, and meeting multiple dead ends eventually led me to exactly what I was looking for. Patience, taking a step back and revisiting all of my evidence when all felt lost, was exactly what I needed to solve this mystery. I had to let go of the idea of due dates and expectations and just simply take things one day at a time. And it was worth it. When you lead with patience, the answer is more likely to be right around the corner, and in my case, it was the very last place I would have ever expected. As someone who grew up watching a ton of Sailor Moon, Saban Moon has always been on my radar, and the idea of an Americanized incarnation deeply fascinated me. This show influenced so many people across the globe for so many different reasons, and I feel a great deal of pride and a huge sense of accomplishment being able to track down a lost relic relating to something that I hold very dear to me, and I'm really glad I got to share it with you all today. It was that same satisfaction I felt when the Mean Girls game had landed into my lap. I wasn't going to stop until I found it, 
And now that this is all over, that nagging feeling is finally worn away. All of my conquests and discoveries so far have only served to motivate me further in my exploration of other lost media. And I may not have been able to uncover the identity of Sailor Venus, but I'm sure after this documentary comes out, every other mystery connected to Saban Moon, whatever is left of it, will fall back into place. The fan community of Moonies can be sure of it. Oh, and by the way, I'm still waiting to receive the remainder of the documents I had requested from the Library of Congress. It should hopefully find its way to my mailbox within the coming weeks? Perhaps it's more Saban Moon secrets. Or maybe it will turn out to be something entirely different. But until then, I'd say that the biggest piece of the puzzle has finally been solved. This case is closed. Thank you.